Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Isaac Mack. Welcome to the MCC. Joining me today is a very, very special guest. Uh, his name is Dr. Adib Jurgis. This man has a resume that is pages and pages long, and I'm talking pages long. Uh, he's born in Al Khosh and received his degree, his first university degree in Baghdad, his master's in Mosul. Uh, he holds a PhD in biochemistry, which he received at the University of Queensland. Uh, his scientific research spans for over 30 years from studying diseases in animals such as koalas uh, to cardiovascular diseases and cancers in humans. He is a father of four, grandfather of five. Uh, Dr. Adib has been featured on TV shows such as Totally Wild, written about in Who's Who of magazines, had over 40 publications in journals around the world, and also re received countless awards for his research. Uh, Dr. Adib is a member of the scientific societies both in Australia and American overseas. He was also a lecturer for medicine for over 15 years in the University of Queensland. He has worked and studied all over the world and is now enjoying retirement, but continues to keep himself busy by holding leadership roles in St. Malachi's Church in Brisbane. On top of all that, he happens to be my dear father. So mm. we're very, very honored and proud to have him on. So Dr. Adib, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. So first, I have a very important question for you. Um, how's the veggie garden? Oh, it's excellent. <laughs> You're growing everything, almost. <laughs> All the veggies that we need. <laughs> What's in season right now in uh, the George's household? Well, the season is, you know, in, winter is gone now. But what we fruit or vegetable is summer, left? so... So all the winter things is gone now and we start growing something which is for summer season, you know. Have you any Roman growing? Yeah, yeah, pomegranate is growing a few. <laughs> One of the trees is not doing well. I don't know what's happened. <laughs> <laughs> the others, uh, lemon is growing, lime is growing, so it's all right. Oh, yeah. good. So for people who don't know, my father has a phenomenal veggie garden at the back with all the... Uh, Anything you can imagine, all the herbs. Yeah. It's quite it's quite good. I enjoy uh, time with it always. Yeah, yeah I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. it's been quite a journey for you, right? You know, what do you think when you hear me speaking about all your achievements and the journey you've had so far? What does that do for you? Well, it's a good summary. What you mm. said it's it's okay, but my story is a very long, long, long one. Yeah, I'm happy good. with it because I was you know, facing lots of difficulties and obstacles, but I come over it and then I was really feeling hard in some point of my life, but now it's everything is good. Yeah. So I achieved what I what I planned for. Yeah. That's yeah. that's more important. Yeah. And you were born originally in El Kosh? Yeah. Well, this is a very nice story about my birth because um the place of birth is in a small town called Al Kush, which is which is in the north of Mesopotamia, hmm. the land between two river, two rivers. Iraq today. Tigris, Euphrates. Yeah, Tigris and Euphrates, which is Iraq today, and it is, for me, it's very ancient city because it's the birth the the birthplace of the prophet Nahum which is estimated about 700 years before Christ. Wow. And his tomb is still there. Still in Al-Qosh. Yeah, still in Al-Qosh. And I think they start to probably renovate it and make it to, be, to look really great because he was the prophet who predicted the fall of Nineveh. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's happened in 612 BC, before Christ. And Al Kosh was about 45 kilometers from Mosul. Mm. Mosul is the capital of uh, the Nineveh province, or they call it governorate. Yep. And there's still people in it, it's about 5,000 to 7,000 people. Mm. And one of the monasteries in Al Kosh is very old one, it's about 15, 1,500 years old. Yeah. Still exists, still there. Exactly plus other places, very interesting places. It's very interesting, small town. Yeah. yeah. I love it, really. 
it's beautiful. a beautiful town, yeah. I still remember it as a kid, it's, yeah. it's wonderful. So I, I born in my grandparents' house in Alkosh from my mom's side. Yeah. And then when I was three months old, my mom traveled to Mosul because my grandparents from my dad's side it's living in Mosul. Oh, that's why you went. Yeah, so we we lived there till I left Iraq. We lived in Mosul. So that was the beginning of my life. So you were the only one born in Al Khosh, all the other brothers yeah. in Mosul. Yeah, all my other brothers born in Mosul. Okay. Yeah. The first shock I face in Mosul is when I lost my brother when I was four years old. Yeah. Yeah, he How died from he pneumonia. Hmm? How old was he again? About one, one, one year, one a bit. Wow. Yeah. yeah, he was young, but he was walking in the, I still remember him like today. Wow. Walking around and talking and making some sounds. And I still remember his face. He was so beautiful boy. Oh. Yeah. But anyway, he died from pneumonia. Maybe in these days we will never lose that sort of yeah. person at all. Yeah. So depend on the medicine, treatment and place when you live there. You know, that's, a, it's, it's, that's a big uh, shock. That's a big shock for you being such a young age and seeing that. Yeah. 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 I still remember it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you like you're one of 12 kids. Uh, but you were the first, so obviously you're the favorite by your your mom and dad. Yeah, I was the favorite by my dad and mom, my uncles. Uh, my uncles. Because <laughs> I've got only one uncle, one aunt. So don't say that I was a spoiled kid. No, I wasn't. Um, of course not. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no. your, your mother, my grandmother, God bless her, you know, she's passed on, but she ended up having 14 kids, yes? Yes. She missed. She lost one, and my, my brother that I talked about him died young at the age of one or one and a few months. I don't remember exactly his, his age, but he was over one year. Yeah. yeah. So sad. Yeah. Um, and I've got three brothers and eight sisters. Eight sisters. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you remember most from your childhood in Iraq? What, what sticks out the most? Well, in, in, uh, in primary school, I was in the school which is run by the church. Okay. I mean, was uh, name was Shamoun Safa, and later changed their name to Babel due to, you know, you know discrimination always in, in Iraq. Yeah. And uh, the Christian always treated as a second class citizen, always. Yeah. Even, even when you were like very young? Yeah, even mm. I, I remember when 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 accident and one thing happened to me and I was really upset about it, very upset about it. I was in grade eight, and uh, we have an exam in social. What what they call it? Social uh, subject, something like that. Mm. And then after the after we finished the exam, the teacher took the papers and then corrected and bring it back to us to have a look on the marks and whatever. Yep. I looked on the mark of mine and versus the, the person sitting next to me. And, and I did better than him. And he was cheating, looking on my paper and writing and writing and writing. Mm. And then I looked on the mark. The teacher gave him 74% and he gave me 56%. Wow. I went to the teacher. I said, listen, I think I did very well. Why you give me that low mark? Mm. He said, you're Christian and you're arguing about my marking? Well, Go back to your place, otherwise I will fail you. Jeez. I still remember that. So that, that was something made me to feel that why they do that to us. Yeah, yeah. And when I came to Australia, I keep, you know, comparing how they treat the Christian in Iraq this is how they treat Muslims here in, in Australia, mm. with, with dignity, with the freedom, with democracy, with everything. So that, that hurt me a lot at that time. Yeah. But, you know, time going on, and then I pass, 
that and reached the high school and then I I went through there very easy and then I I apply you know to do a lot of things I first of all I was interested in army I applied to join the army but my mom didn't let me do that I Not went the and they I did the <laughs> all the exam and you know the things which is very hard some of them to see how your body can cope with the army and so on mm. and i was accepted but my mom didn't let me to go and uh, the only thing she asked me to do is to do to study something and to become a teacher no oh, that's what she wanted. why because the teacher are exempt from from army services oh. they're not joining the army they exempt so they said okay you go and do that because I don't want you to go to the army and there is a war, always war in Iraq, always fighting. Yeah. There is no fighting uh, from any enemy outside, they're, they're fighting each other. That's life. Yeah. That's life. Yeah, so I, I joined, you know, College of Education in Baghdad, four years, and then uh, I have a degree in biology. Mm. And then after that, we applied to work as a teachers. So I came first among all these teachers. And then in the interview, they asked me which, uh, which school you want to go. I said, well, I, I want to go to, I mean, I mentioned the name of the school. I said, why? There is many schools. There's a big school. So why are you going to this one? I said, because my mom asked me to, to work here. It's very close to my place. <laughs> you, you, were, you were pleasing your mom. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, because it's very close to my place, so I, I'm going, I, I want this one. I said, okay, because you first, so we can argue with your choice, so you can start tomorrow. So I went next day. Wow. And you were very young. You were, I think you've told me you were only, what, 21 or? 21 years. Yeah. 21 years. Were you teaching? And were you teaching high school or uni? High school. High school. Okay. Yeah, because I, I got a degree, undergraduate degree in bio, Bachelor of Biology. In biology, but I was teaching sometimes chemistry as well. And I heard that you were very uh, straight, strong teacher. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, well, when you live in, in tough conditions you have to be tough otherwise you will never succeed yeah that's what so i was tough in everything preparing even thinking about my body has to be very strong as well physically so people can yeah when they see me they will say oh yeah he's a a big a big teacher he's not like a tiny <laughs> small <laughs> yeah well, that's that's just the environment that you're in you have to yeah, be yeah that's so you have to be you accommodate yourself to what, what you do, what you live with, and how the people think about you, and how, how you're going to achieve something mm. in a new job, because it's, everything for me was new. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To, to become a teacher and then to have responsibility to look after the, the classes, and, you know, it's, it's a big responsibility. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And what was what was life like for your parents growing up in that time? Well, my dad he was a, a school bus driver, mm. and he was working also driving taxi after after you know, was, of course. Mm. And uh, they were okay. I mean, they were surviving, and my dad was very hard worker. Mm. He. He was working day and night. He doesn't actually uh, say okay. anything. He just wake up early in the morning, going to work, and then driving the bus for the school, and then taxi after that. So he was a great man. He yeah. was a great man. Tell us more about your dad, like uh, Baba Abed. He was, he was not your normal person. He had some things about him that were... Yeah, well, I remember things... And I, I've been told by my uncle about him. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't sit and say, I was like that and I was that and that, but I heard from other sources. When he was in the army during the World War II, mm. there were a fight between the British forces and the Iraqi forces in Fallujah. 
which is south of Baghdad. Yes. And all the people in the army, the Iraqi army, they left their arms, they even changed their, their they, they throw the uniform, change it, wear something else and escape. And he was the only person who stayed with his uh, ammunition, with everything he got, and he was still in the army form, uniform, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the bombing stopped, he walked to the, to the base where, where the army, uh, uh, like, collect the, the remaining of the soldiers. You know, all the soldiers went in, in different yeah. direction and they yeah. make like a base and the army came. And he's the only one coming with his uniform, with his uh, guns, with everything, all the ammunition, and he didn't drop anyone. Wow. And, yeah, and the, the well, the, the, so, the sergeant welcomed him and then presenting, presented him to the, to the officer, like captain, whatever, something in the army. And he was talking about him, how brave he is. And then he was- he stayed, he stayed fighting the whole time. Yes. Right. And, and he was promoted from soldier, normal soldier to like uh, private. Private, yeah. yeah. A bit higher mm. uh, rank. I think it's about a bit higher rank. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Well. And uh, yeah, he was very, very strong man. He was a very strong man. I still remember him, you know, when he was young. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. so early, so early. And he had like very, like physical strength was ridiculous. I remember, was I remember it? when I was a child, probably about my son's age, three or four years old, and we were in a little area in Mosul in our old house, and we had a big black dog. Yes. And my grandfather, your dad, put his finger out like this. And the dog came and was chewing on his finger. <laughs> uh, and I'm looking at, there's no stab, no blood, no nothing. He, I don't know what his hands were made out of. <laughs> yeah. Well, when we built our house, maybe you remember our house in, in Mosul. Yeah. Yeah. He was working like, you know, stronger than us. Mm. We were three boys and he was by himself and he said, hey guys, what's happened to you? Come on. <laughs> he was so strong. I mean, we were amazed about this boy. Yeah, he was good. And he even lifted up the old Chevy, I think. When one, yeah. one of your... yeah, one of the tires was flat a bit and he from the back and he lifted up. He was so Chevy. strong. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah, God bless so, his soul. Yeah, God bless him. He's a great man. Um, and talking about your physical presence, um, you also developed a love for bodybuilding, yes? Yes, I was mad about sport. I love all type of sport, from soccer to volleyball to basketball to triple jump to whatever. <laughs> swimming, I was swimming in Tigris River for, for hours. Not in the Tigris hours. River? Yes. Oh, wow. uh, crossing the Tigris River from one side to the other side and swimming in, in Tigris River almost every day in summer. Yeah. Okay. and. Uh, I was fascinating about bodybuilding because I saw all the people having those big muscles and showing their body there. <laughs> so when I was young, I was looking and keep looking in the mirror. I said, well, I'm going to grow up a bit. So I want to do a bodybuilding. <laughs> <laughs> so I, so I, I start when I was 16. 16. 16. Because that was the time when Arnold was it starting to... Oh, yes, 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 yeah. yeah. Arnold is almost in my age. Oh, okay, similar, yeah. yeah but I'm, I'm now bigger than him. He's, getting, he's shrinking a bit. He's shrinking, yeah. You're still... <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So you so, did that for a few so years? When, when I went to Baghdad, when mm -hmm. I moved to Baghdad to study at the university, I was keeping you know, going to the club and doing my program and... And one of the, the trainer, he was the trainer of those uh, uh, big Iraqi bodybuilders. Yeah. So he told me that if you keep going, we'll probably be in, in one of the competition for your height. Okay. But 
the time was run so quickly. I finished my study and went back to Mosul, but I was still going to the yeah. to the club there as well. Yeah. And then when I become a teacher, I used to probably teach in three schools. One in the morning from eight to twelve, the other from twelve to five, and at the night from like from five to eight, something like that. Mm. Not every day, some of the days. So I was so tired and so busy, I couldn't actually cope with it. So I left the bodybuilding for a while. Between time to time, I was doing it. Wasn't that much care. Mm. Yeah, and uh, even to this day, I know you still keep fit. You do your push-ups in the morning. You do all that? Yeah, I still do some exercise and just to keep my body as it was. It's a big difference than before, but anyway, <laughs> try my best. I'll do your lap pose. <laughs> uh, and you know sorry going back to the time when you say so finish your teach you went back from you went from iraq to mosul um yeah. you started teaching again in three schools um i remember you telling me there's a time in your life where you had to carry a gun at all times uh, i mean i think iraq was communist before saddam is that correct well, it wasn't, wasn't communist, but was trouble always, you know, like when, when, uh, when was the most the revolution, when, when the Iraq become republic, he was a kingdom. Yeah. Okay. was a king, which is, he was the cousin of King Hussein of Jordan. And there was a king in, in uh, Syria and another king in Saudi Arabia. They all form one family. Oh, wow. Okay. They were appointed kings in, by the British. Uh, because Iraq was one of the British colony yeah. at that time. Yeah, from uh, probably from after the World War One till 1958, when Iraq became republic. Yeah. So what was the toughest, uh, the hardest time in Iraq? Do you think the most dangerous time was that in the Iran-Iraq War? Or well, you know, the 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 more dangerous part of Iraq or or life in Iraq, because there are so many parties mm. like communist bath parties islamic parties whatever you name it there's quite very high number of parties and they fighting each other yeah so whatever if you join one party not the other you will probably in trouble yeah. so you have to to think about it how to survive with this sort of environment which is really very hard yeah so it was always trouble always uh, killing, hanging, assassinations happening everywhere and kidnapping, mm. asking for ransoms and they do a lot of funny things and well it wasn't funny but it is sad for the people to live in that sort of environment yeah. but what we can do that was life. Till Saddam came to the, to the power in 1979 and then in 1980 the war started between Iraq and Iran. Mm -hmm. And then the Iraq went also in a miserable situation again. Yeah. Because of the war, a million of people died and, and from both sides. And then a million of people become injured and the economy went down and everything was in shambles, in, in terrible situations. Yeah. We'll get back to that because um, I just want to stay on the timeline. <laughs> so after... <laughs> After you went, you went, uh, you came back to Mosul, you were teaching. Then you get married to a lovely young Al Khoshi lady by the name of Feria Faye. Yes. yes. Uh, and then kids start to come along. You have a, you first was uh, my sister. Yep. She's the eldest. Um, how was life? Did life change a lot after marriage? Well, wasn't a good, uh, I, call, I call it the, gold, the golden years okay. from. Uh, 1970 or 69-70 si like that sort of thing till 79. Mm. It's about 10 years I call them the golden years and that's every good Iraqi, that's every good Iraqi born that. acknowledged that really <laughs> and before the, the start the, before the war start between, yeah. started between Iraq and Iran yeah okay and people start building houses looking for jobs and Look like everything's settling down, mm. but look like there is some preparation for, for war. And my dad, 
God bless his soul, he said, this guy is not, is not relaxing. He is planning for something bad for the country. I that can't dumb. Yeah, yeah. That's so dumb. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he started, you know, talking about that because they were, look like asking everybody to join the army, reserve army, uh, popular army, which is Jay Shabi, they call it. Yes. And they start, you know, like bringing all the people to become like a big, huge army. Mm -hmm. So he said, why are you doing that? The, 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 the country doesn't need that many people. They doesn't need that, that sort of preparation. Why are you taking people from their jobs and then put them in an army to train them and make them ready to, to fight and whatever or whatever. Yeah. So that, that was uh, the situation in the 70s, at the time we call it the golden years mm. of Iraq. But after the war started, everything changed. So my grandfather predicted that because yes. uh, he, he said that he, Saddam would probably ruin the country, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. He was very popular at the beginning of his life. Mm. People loved him so much and he was looked like uh, doing well for the people. But after that, he changed. He changed completely. When, he, when the war started, he'd become a different person. Yeah, yeah, he was recruiting everyone. Even during the war, some people, if, it's, if, if they didn't affect it by the war, he, they were okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, some people lost their sons. I remember one of the family lost four sons wow. in the army. So that was their disaster because the workforces is the young people. If we mm. lose the young people, who's, who's going to run the country? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the problem at that time. Yeah. So, and not long after you, you get married, um, kids come along, I came along. Uh, so my, I had my sister, my older brother than me. Um, and then it was the 1980s, and uh, there was a there was talk of you going overseas, like leaving Iraq. Was that was that a goal for you, or was that something that was suggested to you with the after you got your master's degree? See, what I was a very ambitious person. Hmm. So you, um, sorry, you, um, you got you got your master's degree, didn't you? In that time? No, no. Uh, I I start my master's degree in 1980. Okay, yeah. 1980. I'm talking about the 70s. I was thinking about, uh, you know, doing a higher degree, but where and how mm. with this situation in Iraq. Yeah. By the way, I went to Algeria to, to teach there for two years from 77, 76, 77, 77, 78, because the, the year is bit of 76, bit of 77. So anyway, for two years. And that, how did that happen? Because Algeria was, you know, when they start to uh, change all the subjects from French to Arabic, uh. they need people from country like Egypt, Iraq, Syria, whatever, to go and teach there. Okay. And that's why they call us to do that, to help Algeria at that time. Your, your mom wouldn't have been happy. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. Because I was thinking to to see the world. I never, you know, traveled before. I only went to Kuwait in 1971, just for a short trip because my aunt was none over there, okay. and, you know. So I went there to visit her, that's all. So I, we, uh, I thought I'll probably see France and then see uh, Europe, a bit of Europe, and uh, that was my dream. And you did that? <laughs> yeah, so I went to uh, Algeria, and when I finished my work, I went back to from Algeria to Paris with my brother-in-law God bless his soul he just passed away recently mm, yes and we drove the car from France to yes. to Italy Switzerland uh, Bulgaria Yugos Yugoslavia the old Yugoslavia mm. the former Yugoslavia and then Bulgaria and then Turkey and then Iraq so we saw almost most of Europe beautiful yeah and it was really very nice, it was my dream to have that trip and then drive all the way. It's about probably 16,000 Ks. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was in between. And then at the same time in 1979, mm -hmm. I was applying to, to do my master's degree in England. 
And uh -huh. then I, I uh, uh, applied for some universities, but I preferred to go to Manchester. So I, I applied for, to, to do my master's degree in, in physiology. Mm. And then I, I was offered the job, uh, a place there in Manchester. I said, okay, I'll go and be with my love, beloved team. Manchester <laughs> <laughs> United. Yeah. Oh. So for two years, I said, well, I, my study was for two years. Yeah. <laughs> and then everything went all right. Application was ap approved. Yep. So the last bit to um, the minister of education had to sign it because I was a teacher. Yep. Give me a scholarship to leave the country. Yes. Or to permit me to leave the country. Hmm. So I, I went to the Ministry of Education waiting for the result. And then the, the person who was the secretary of the, the minister, he came to me. He wasn't look okay. I said, what's wrong? He said, well, the, the, the minister rejects your application. I said, why? He said, he said that this time we don't, we don't need our teachers to leave the country. No. So I was very, I was very upset because I went to get the visa from the British embassy in Baghdad. You got that? Got that, yeah, the preliminary visa. I said, well, go and book your flight and then we'll give you the visa and you can go because you, you already accepted at the university. And then I tried to transfer some money from, you know, Iraqi currency to, to pound to Brisbane uh, to British currency. Yeah. And then to go, and then I was shocked that the minister reject my application. Yeah. So, we, so we I could. said, uh, what can I do? And some people advised me, why, why not apply here to the university? I said, well, what do you think? I was dreaming to go to Manchester. Now I go to University of Mosul. What a big <laughs> jump. <laughs> anyway, I put an application. I wasn't actually thought about it. I just, and one day my sister, I classed, she came to me, said, why are you sitting here? I said, what's going on? She said, your name is in the postgraduate list. Oh. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, go and see. <laughs> so I start my master's degree in uh, 1980. A uh, lot of people, they were amazed because they said, you left this, the uni for 10 years because I started working as a teacher from 1970 yeah. to 1980, exactly 10 years. 10 years, yeah. And said, you probably missed everything. Now the world has changed. The science has changed. Everything has changed. And your master's was in? In physiology. Physiology. You did that in physiology. Yeah. 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 So I said, well, I'll try. I'll do it. I feel that I can't do it. Yeah, it was very hard for me at the beginning because some of the subjects I have no idea about them, zero. Mm. So I start from reading from very basic uh, books and then gradually I try to, to pass, you know, and then I finish first among all of my colleagues. You finish first again? Always I was first, <laughs> all the way. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I heard about it. <laughs> Growing up, I heard about it. Yeah. So, okay. So, it was your ambition to always go overseas? Hence, we ended up in Australia. Yeah. Um, so, what happened there? So, at the time, I think is this. Am I right when saying that there was possibility of us going to Germany or Australia? Yeah, well, I see what happened there because normally people, when they apply to do higher degrees. They mm. apply to many places. Yeah. So whatever offer, and they study the offer, and then they choose one or them. Okay. And that's what I did. I applied for Bonn University in Germany, and Swansea College in England, and then John Hopkins in, a, in, in America. America. Yeah. And, and I've, got a, I've got an offer from all of them. Oh, OK. So they all said yes. All said yes. Including, including University of Queensland. Yeah. So I was sitting, thinking about where shall I go? Where shall I go? I'm not by myself. I've got a wife and four kids. <laughs> it's a heavy, heavy job. And all the people there, they said, don't go. You will never do it. How going to look you after your family and then you do a PhD 
in what in genetic engineering mm. that was my scholarship on genetic and genetic engineering was a new subject in Iraq. Nobody knows about it. And myself, I wasn't actually familiar with it that much. Just a little bit about genes, chromosomes, cells, and whatever, whatever. Yeah. But details, nothing, zero. Mm -hmm. So I was in between, where shall I go? If I go to Germany, I have to learn German language, which is very hard, it's not easy. <laughs> if I go to England, England is very expensive for family to live there. Yeah. If I go to John Hopkins, they said, we offer you a place, but in 1986. Oh, okay. A year. Time was 85. Yeah. When I applied. The only university offered me the, the place to start in 1985 was University of Queensland. So I went to the Australian embassy in Baghdad, hmm. met the cultural attache. He sat with me and started talking about Brisbane, about Queensland, about whatever, whatever. It's a beautiful city, beautiful university. It's one of the top 100 university in the world. And he started explaining you know, to me how was life in, in Australia. And well, I said, probably I've got a family, probably this is the best place for me. Good. So, that's the full story. And then and we start, you know, I was in the army, by the way. At that time? At that time. And then when I got the scholarship from University of Mosul, they released me from the army. I was a, I appointed in Mosul. They give me a job as assistant le lecturer and then lecturer later on in the third year. Okay. And then after that, I left. So that was yeah, the situation over there. And then when we arrived here, I started a new life, really new life. Let's rewind a little bit because I want to talk about something that I witnessed when I was a little boy. Yeah. So for people who don't know, uh, so your dad, my, my grandfather, I spent a lot of time with him when I was a kid. He was, the, he was retired. He was a preschool driver. Yes. Um, so he was driving me to preschool all the time. And I spent, he was like my hero, you know, at the time because uh, you were in the army. So I was leaning on him for fatherhood, you know, and he's teaching me many great things that I still remember today. Great. Oh, great. You've got a good memory. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I, I saw him as a man of pure strength, like in every way, physical, spiritual, you know, just everything. He, was just, he just signified strength. Why I say all that is because I remember I was in the car with just you two. So there was Baba Abid, my grandfather, and you. And, you know, we're driving. And for the first time in my life, I see a tear go down his eye. And I was shocked. I didn't know what to, how to... Uh, and how to actually, well, what to make of that. And uh, I remember him, and I, you told me the exact conversation, but I remember it vaguely. He said something to you like, I think this is the last time I see you, and something like that. Yeah, yeah. Can you, can you, and you gave him, and he asked you to make a promise to him about something. Can you, can you uh, tell the people what that conversation was about? Yeah, well, well, you know, the relationship between me and him wasn't like father and son, really, like a good friends. Yes. And he was saying that all the time. He said, Adib is not my son. He's my friend. He's my brother. He's everything. Wow. And he was dependent on me in everything because I was the eldest. And uh, by, you know, by all means, I was controlling everything in the house and looking after the house. And my brothers were still young, mm, mm. They're still young. And I had to look after them as well. And he, one of his, when he, one of his talk, he was keep telling me, look after your brothers. Don't like leave them or don't do anything that's not pleasing you. Mm. Do whatever you feel it's right. You are, you are not my son. You are my friend. You are my brother. You are everything. Mm. And I want you to go because I know this country is not going to be good. Iraq. Give me that. Iraq, yeah. yeah. And he said, I feel that the blood everywhere. Everywhere. So that's mean there will be fight. There will be killing. There will be, you know. Mm assassination as I as I mentioned there will be all this type of 
violence. Yeah. So he was in between, like allowing me to go and not. So because he he was so close to my kids, he was so close to me as well. Mm. So he doesn't want me to go. But I said to him, listen, I'm only going for three years mm. and then I'll be back. Yeah, and that comfort, comfort him a bit, mm. not much. So he was like thinking about, there will be three, maximum four years and he'll be back. Mm. And that was my plan actually. I wasn't actually thinking about staying in Australia 1%. So just do your PhD and then and come back. Mm. And that's what happened actually. When I was finishing my PhD around 1990, I was packing up. Yeah. And, yeah. I Get remember. ready to go back to Iraq. I said, we'll go to Kuwait first, buy some furniture from there because they fancy ones, <laughs> and buy a car, and then drive the car back to Mosul. But that, I just want to, I just want to go back a little bit. Sorry, Dan. Uh, I just, but I remember your dad said that he felt that that was the last time he would see you. Correct? Yeah. Who, yes. He said, maybe I'm not going to see you again, but I will tell you what. Mm. Whenever you go, you will succeed. That's what's his word always. And if you touch the, touch the, the soil, it'll turn to gold. That's mm -hmm. in, that's a, word by word translation from our you know language to English. Yeah. yeah. And he asked you to stay there though, didn't he? And bring your brothers. Yes. He he asked me when I when I was in the car going to the uh, to the probably to Baghdad I think was yeah, working I was... my papers and whatever, getting you my papers ready to travel to Australia because I left first. I left you behind. No, no. You and your brothers and sister and mom. So you were, you came after two months. Yes. So I went first to, to rent a place and buy some furniture, whatever, and get it ready. So when you arrive, the house will be there. Yeah. And that's why, because we were in a big house. You remember the house maybe in Iraq. Yeah, St. Lucia. No, 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 in Iraq. Oh, sorry. In it was a huge huge house with eight bedrooms and you know two yeah it was a big one mm. i said if i bring my kids to one of the units here they will die they are not going to survive <laughs> so i have to buy <laughs> to rent a good house so yeah. we went to st lucia rent that house close to the brisbane river yes and good. it was a very nice one yeah yeah i said yeah this one probably my kids will be happy <laughs> they will be happy here so that's the idea and going back to that conversation, so your dad basically made you give him his your word that you would, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you would stay in Australia, get your brothers there, and then have a conversation with them to say that this was my father's wish. Is that accurate? Yes, yes, yes. I mentioned to them many times, yeah. And they know that, I mean, it's mm. because they... When I left, they were with my dad all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they, probably they, they, he talked to them about that as well. Yeah. I assumed he did that. Yeah. But anyway, I think it's, it's I feel that I I've, I've did a, good, a great job by, you know, coming mm -hmm. here and bringing them all, my brothers and my sisters. You did amazing. So... I work hard to get them here, by all means. Hmm. And thanks God, everything went all right. And I want to ask you as well, you were the first from our family to come to Australia, obviously. How did you feel personally going from what you just said, a house with eight bedrooms, and you know, we all live together, all your brothers, your sisters, your parents, us, yeah. Yeah. all of us together in a community in Iraq. How did you feel... <laughs> How was the adjustment for you personally? I know what it was for us, but how was it for you going from that to this? Did you, did it take you a while to adjust or were you too busy exploring because, you know, it was like a new adventure? Yeah, well, it, it is like a new adventure. Really, I was, 
I was thinking about life here because I was at, I mentioned to you when I talked to the cultural attaché in, in the embassy, he mentioned to me a lot of things, but when I arrived here, mm. I couldn't see the, you know, the, the life that he, he mentioned about it in, in details. That's because he was selling it, he was selling it to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I found that I have to rent a house and also my income was, wasn't that high. Mm. And uh, your youngest brother was still young. I mean, when he arrived here, he was six months old. Yeah. So my wife couldn't work at that time till he become around, around three. Mm. I was taking him to play school in the university because that's for the, for the, for the staff and the postgraduate mm. Mm. at the uni. And uh, your mom carried, carried the burden, Chile. She started working. Yeah. and start, you know, making our life become better and better. Yeah. And I was working as well while I was studying as well. So I don't want to, to talk about my life when I start my PhD. This is really, really hard. If somebody in my position, he will escape and go anywhere. No, no, no. It's, that's the whole point of this conversation is because I know what you went through and it, it might scare some people off, but it'll actually give people inspiration, you know, to yeah. pursue. Because I remember you also, you were doing your PhD during the day, and then at night you were... Yeah, till... I was working in, in Sunday Sun and Korea Mail. Yeah. At night, mm. from 11 o'clock till 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And then studying. So did you, and you yeah. never, and I know you never complained about being tired, because I think... Well, I believe that you got that work ethic from your father. Yes. It's just natural. And I remember one time I asked you, uh, I don't know if you remember this. I asked you, dad, are you ever tired? And you looked at me like, no, you looked at me like I said something, like I said something blasphemous. <laughs> you, said, you said to me, Eb, Eb, which, which is basically saying it's, it's shame to actually even say you're yeah. tired. Yeah. yeah. Till now, I never feel tired. No, oh, no, it's uh, yeah. that's what I love about you. Yeah, my body is not that strong like before, but you know, <laughs> yeah, spiritually, I'm strong. I <laughs> know. No. So, the plan, um, like you said, the plan was to go back to Iraq, you're already getting ready. Yes, and what was it, the Gulf War that stopped all that? Yes, that was 1990. Yeah, and at the same time, the uni offered me a job, so that's make me to think twice. I've got an offer from University of California when I finished my PhD. Oh, right. As well, yeah. Still, I have the offer yeah. in my files. And then I was in between either to go there or stay in, in Brisbane. So I talked to my wife and then we thought that even to you guys, maybe if you remember, I don't know what, that was in 1992. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was in between because Having a job in University of California is not, e is not easy for everyone. Oh, Only the top people can get that sort of. And if you, if you go and do, do your postdoctorate there, that, mm -hmm. that was, even in my colleagues at the university, they said, you should never think about saying no. Go and take the job. <laughs> it's USA. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I don't care about USA. I just care about my family, <laughs> my wife and kids. Yeah. Then we decided to stay. So they offered me a job at the University of Queensland. Mm. And then I stayed at the uni till I retired. The same uni, yeah. And yeah, same uni. So then once, once, you, once you knew that you, we weren't going back to Iraq, you accepted the job. Uh, so the next thing was obviously to get a permanent residency and yeah. Yeah? yeah. Well, the, this is the, the first obstacle in my life is how to change my visa from student visa to working visa. Yeah. When I get the job, I succeed in that. So they, they changed my visa to working visa. Working visa, yeah. And then that's allowed me to apply for a residency. And then I applied for that. It took about two years and more, I think. And then finally they accept me as a permanent residence. And because I wasn't, I wasn't a refugee. My brother came, my brother Rod came as a refugee mm. and he got the citizenship 
before before me. <laughs> and he came six years after I arrived in Australia. Yeah, six, seven years. Yeah. Years, yeah. Or more, yeah. Yeah, I mean he arrived in nineteen ninety-two. And I was here from nineteen eighty-five, so seven years. Mm. After me, and he got the citizenship before I got it. <laughs> he'll be he'll be laughing when he hears this interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, and I just want to talk about that as well because the fact that you stayed in Australia that made the people back in Iraq, the government, very upset, didn't it? Yes, because well, well, the the purpose of giving people scholarship it's just to get more educated people to to work in iraq because they they were questioning your brothers weren't they yeah yeah definitely Mm. because every person is not going back to iraq they go after their families and asking why they didn't return what's going wrong are they against the government against Uh, and so on so this million of questions Mm. And they start to harass them and, you know, put the pressure on them to, to make their, you know, brothers or sister, whatever, overseas to, to come back. Okay. Yeah. And so they were doing was, this? Yeah. What's happening? What was happening? Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. And then uh, first one, Rod left, and then uh, the rest of the family start to leave gradually and then they arrived here because they were they were all feeling that pressure weren't they from the government yeah yeah okay yeah and i was keep talking to them i said leave come on don't don't wait Mm. because you don't know what's the situation yeah it's just gonna get worse the iraq iran war finished at 88 and then he went into kuwait start another war yeah and Iraq was bombed by the Allies, and then you know, you know what happening at at that time. Yeah, and life become really bad day after day. Well, yeah, and yeah, they did the right thing. Obviously, now they're enjoying life here, which is great. Now, yeah, well, yeah. Thanks I'm, to happy. You. I'm very. I'm, I call myself. I'm a very fortunate person to yeah. have a great family, to have a very lovely brothers and sisters. So that was my dream, and thanks God for everything. It's great. Uh, you're, you're blessed. Um, tell me about your studies uh, for a bit. So you spent your whole life, almost your whole life in Australia as a researcher. Uh, I think for a while you were working on koalas, and as a result, um, you were on that popular TV show, Totally Wild. Uh, yeah, I well, I mean, the... They interview me lots of time and talk to me. So what what got it's easy for me to talk in about science? Yeah. Very easy because I all my life is with science. I love I love research. I love teaching. I love all this. I love the uni atmosphere really. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, because you you live with the new generation, and every year you get the new generation. They very hungry and thirsty to knowledge, to study, to mm. understand. They ask million of questions and so on, so so that that sort of environment, I love it. Yeah. What were you stu- What were you working on for the TV show to want to interview you? Well, what we see in the koala project is was first of all to study the, a bacteria infecting koalas and causing blindness and infertility. Oh. And the, the population of koala was going down because of those two to major diseases affecting koalas. Mm. So when the koala become blind, she failed to, or, or he, whatever, failed to climb the trees and they, they yeah. die. And they get attacked by dogs, attacked by, you know, run by cars and so on. Yeah. So they, they lose control and they can, you know, uh, go with their life. And if they can they become infertile, they, they can, you know, bring uh, babies or whatever. Mm-hmm. So there's no offsprings coming and then yeah. the population of koalas start to go down. So my first project is to look on the, on the bacteria called the chlamydia. 
chlamydia. Which is uh, in between, between bacteria and viruses. It behaves like viruses because they're intracellular parasites. They live inside the cells. Okay. They can live outside the cells. Lately, before I retired, I discovered that something they can probably live outside the cells, but I didn't have time to finish that sort of research. And then I let the other people, the young people, to come and take over. And they probably searching on that direction. So what happened? First of all, I discovered the two strain of chlamydia infecting koalas. One is infecting the eye, one infecting the urogenital system. Mm -hmm. And I start to characterize these strains, working on immunogenic gene, see which gene is uh, responsible for stimulating the immune system to react against chlamydia. And we probably identify a few, a few I, identify, I shouldn't say we, I identify a few genes. And then we published a few papers on that. And uh, that's during my PhD. I didn't actually talk about the difficulties because when I start studying here, I came to a field I know nothing about it. Mm. This is the big challenge was for me. So that sort of feeling make me to study even harder because I don't know anything about genetic engineering. I don't know about gene, gene function, gene structure, mm. uh, gene cloning, how we're going to transfer the gene from one side to the other, from animal to bacteria, from bacteria to viruses and so on. So that sort of uh, technique, I wasn't familiar with it because I didn't study that in, in my undergraduate, in the, even in my master degree, I didn't study that at all. So nothing, so everything was new. And uh, yeah, I start, you know, studying hard, hard. And then I, in six months time, I start, you know, understand what they're talking about. Yeah. When I, you know, I was going to lectures. I wasn't asked to go to lectures just to get myself familiar with what they're talking about to understand all these terms and all these subjects or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then in six months time, I start, you know, understanding what I'm doing, whatever. And then I came to, to my supervisor. I said, I'm not going to, to do English courses because I'm wasting my time. I want to come to the lab and work. Mm. I said, okay, just come in. <laughs> so I start working in the lab and then I feel better because I can mix with the people mm. doing the same work, with yeah, different yeah. subjects, different, different research. Mm -hmm. But I was, you know, very pleased with that. And then I start going to conferences, going overseas, in, inside, and mixing with people, making collaboration with American universities. And, and uh, the circle was growing and growing and growing. And you guys know nothing about my scientific <laughs> life at all. <laughs> it's another life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. And uh, so these diseases and all that stuff, that's all solved now with koalas, isn't it? No. Still going? We were, we were uh, working on vaccine. Okay. To find a vaccine for koala. I was interviewed by ABC station and I was talking about it. Mm. And they asked me a question, when you think the vaccine will be ready? I said, I don't know. If I say in two years time, maybe I will... I will give you a very rough estimation, I don't think. And then when I went to America twice to meet with the people, you know, the, the people were working on the media for probably 50 years or more mm. and working in that scene. And they said, this is a dream. I don't think we will, we will do it. Till now, they don't have the vaccine. Still don't have the vaccine? No. Wow. That's... Well, it's... it's uh, very tricky organism. Chlamydia is intracellular bacteria live inside. Mm. Uh, they can live inside the cell doing nothing. So mm. the person become infected, they call it persistent infection. So they do nothing. And then when the immune system become, you know, uh, abused, whatever, or something happened to the immune system, the bacteria start to grow and start to multiply like a viruses. No. And they spread in the body and cause a lot of damage because some of their bacteria can live in the lungs. Mm. Some of them keep in the urogenital system. Some of them infect the eyes, cause the, the, the damage to the eyes. They call it conjunctiva. Yeah. 
So that the story of the vaccine is not is not easy. Till now, when I talk about you know the situation with the coronavirus, as I said, I don't think they will get the vaccine because I know how to prepare the vaccine. I know how to what sort of tools they use to get the vaccine ready. Mm. But it is different with viruses because they keep changing. Even the flu vaccine now, which is the flu start in 1918 till now, about 102 years, still they don't have very, very strong vaccine for it. People okay. get the shot and that's cool. not preventing them from getting the disease at all. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is why I, I'm so suspicious of, you know, these governments talking about having a coronavirus vaccine by the end of this year or early next year. It's, it's ridiculous to me, and I'm not in science. I just learned a lot of stuff from you yeah. for them to be saying that it can be ready so quickly. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they thought that because what they, what they the, the approach for the vaccine is just either you kill the organism, inject it into another animal, mm. and the animal will produce antiviral antibody, mm. take that one, use it as a vaccine. So that's look like you, you giving your body something to fight the virus or to take the protein, surface protein from the virus, inject it, make the vaccine against that, or probably synthesize it in the lab. Now you can synthesize protein and use it as, as a, a vaccine tool. Mm. Or there is many, many way, or you can block the side where the, the, the virus stick to the cells in the lung. Right. Like he block the side, like the door, the virus go inside that door infecting the cells. Yeah, okay. So if you close that door, the virus unable to go inside the cells. So you can protect it. Okay. Protect the person from the viral infection. But how successful is that? What's the side effect of the vaccine mm. on the body? Mm. Need a lot of study. It's not easy. They, so it's not easy. in your and opinion... How, the vaccine, how long the vaccine will stay in the body? Are you going to be immunized with the vaccine? And the vaccine will protect you for one month? or two months, or six months, or one year, or 10 years, nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody knows. Some right. of the vaccines can protect you for 10 years. Some of the vaccines, you have to have it every year. Yeah, like, for example, when my son was born, I had to have a whooping cough uh, yeah. vaccine. I think that lasts for four years, something like that. Yeah, yeah, almost yeah. like that, yeah. 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 And what you said before, the flu vaccine, from what I've read, they designed that, I think, I don't know, 80 years ago, something like that, in the 1940s or 1930s, and it's still not successful. When they start, because when was first recognized as a Spain flu, and they start working, flu. making vaccine against it, because that start after the World War One, when mm. it's finished at 19, 1918. 18, yeah. The estimation I was, you know, talking about it in one of my talks to the, to the student, mm. The estimation about more than 50 million people died from that. Wow. And the, the people still die from flu yeah. around the world. Thousands yeah. of people. Every day. Every day, exactly. Hmm. So an effective vaccine? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's very hard. Hmm. When I was teaching at the, at the uni, teaching the medical school, at the medical school, so they have a group of people and every group they have a, like a, a person to, to teach them. So my colleague said, let's go and get the flu vaccine. Let's go and get the shot. I said, I don't want it. So after, you know, because we're mixing with the student and the student become infected and that's will affect us. And then I went and have a shot. I was sick for the whole year. For the whole year? Yeah. <laughs> coming back and recovering, coming back, the flu and recovering. And I think I remember that. I, I said, well, I don't think you remember that because that was about 10 years ago. Oh, this, oh okay. No, but I remember you were, okay, maybe it was something else. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, go back to your research. So you studied a lot with animals, koalas in particular. You also did studies on human diseases, I think cardiovascular, yeah. cancer as well. Cancer, I, <clears throat> when I finished my PhD, my supervisor was, was doing a bit of research on 
uh, ionizing radiation because radiation can cause cancer mm. if you're exposed to radiation, whatever. So I did my postdoctoral uh, time with him. He asked me to stay and do because molecular work is the same. Whatever disease you go, you use mm. the same tools, the same technique, and everything. So I worked for for two years with him, looking for cells and the genes that can convert the cells from sensitive to radiation to resistant. Mm. So if the cells become resistant to radiation, so that spin is, that person is not going to be affected. It's not going to cause cancer in him. So look like thinking about prevention. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was very important. Mm. So we, we got some good results and we published a paper from that work as well. And then after two years, because the postdoctoral uh, position, it's only for two years. So I said, I have to probably to look, do something else. Mm. So I chose cardiovascular diseases, remembering my father, because I remember that they said my father died from heart attack. So um, I applied for the, was, was a job advertised mm. for, uh, to work on cardiovascular. And then uh, I applied for that and I've got an offer to work for five years with them. Was so, that at the QIMR, the Queensland Institute of Medical Research? I was in the QIMR. Oh, you Queensland, were there. Yeah. Queensland Institute of Medical Research. I moved back to the uni. But, okay. but you know, the QIMR is affiliated with the university as well. Yeah. Yeah. Still, you are part of the University of Queensland. Yeah. So I went back and worked on cardiovascular diseases, looking for the cause of that sort of blockage in the arteries and whatever, whatever, all these ones. Mm. And we got, we got very good results and we published a few papers from there and and then I, at the same time, I'm still working on chlamydia because I was, uh, I was approached by some of the companies, drug companies, to see if, if, if we can uh, study the effect of a certain drug on, on chlamydia. And one of the drugs was azithromycin. Okay. It's now prescribed for people infected with coronavirus. Really? Yes. Sometimes they give them azithromycin. I think if you remember that video, uh, showing those doctors, you know, those doctors, a group of doctors talking about the corona and using yeah. it. The, the one that got banned? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and how they use those uh, treatment and people recover and whatever. One of them is azithromycin. Oh, okay. Because it's, it's have antiviral uh, properties. Yes. So we, we start looking on, on, uh, on that and growing the cells, culture, culture the cells, and affect the cells with the chlamydia, and then expose them to the antibiotic, antibi antibiotic here to see how it's work. And one of my students, my honor student, was working on that project. And we, we got a good result, but not 100%. Mm. Only we found about between 30 to 40% protection. So wasn't that enough? Yeah, yeah. And then the idea about the, the antibiotic, yeah, they, they said it's, it's cure the person in one shot. If you take the tablet, you will be cured for, for sure. And really? That wasn't, wasn't right. Yeah. Right, no. Yeah. What was, uh, I know you've been hugely successful in what you've done. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, including myself, look up to you. Um, but throughout your work and research, what was the most frustrating part of what you were doing? What was the, some of the restrictions? Well. The problem we faced in, at the university is funding. Funding. Or, I thought so. Yeah. yeah. So every time we apply for new, we, because there is a big competition, and uh, the only funding about 18 to 20 percent of projects. Okay. So you will write the project. You will have some results. You will, you will do it, and you know it's going to work. But because of high competition, mm. you, it doesn't mean that your project is not qualified to have fund or support for it. 
but because of, of that, they had to drop some people. So between time to time, we were getting funding, not getting, and because in the lab, when you're head of the lab, you need, you need support for your student, you need support for your research assistant, you need, mm. you need support for your chemicals, reagents, and whatever, everything. Yes. So that's huge. So when you reach a certain point, it's very hard. So that was hard. We survived for, for so many years. Mm. Then uh, till I reached a certain time, I said, well, that's time for me to retire. I passed even the retiring age. So I said, I'm hanging my boot, that's it. Finished. <laughs> was there times where you were feeling like you were making great progress, like getting close, whether it was koala skin cancer, and they, they removed the funding? Did that happen? You know, like, you know, when we say, you, you know, like creation, creation will never stop. Mm. Still going, it's ongoing. But when we need, what, what the creation need? You need, you need us to, to have some contribution to that. You need us to be more active. Mm. So what, what I feel that probably the new generation with this high tech in these days, mm -hmm. they might probably moving on from what we, from what, you do. what we reach, they can take from that position and move forward. So and that's what I, I, I talked to many people about that, the young people, I said, the, the research and the, the uni require, you know, very active people. Yes. Very active people, not just active people, just to work for the, for the job. And no, you have to think a bit further. How to develop, how to put in new ideas, how to develop methods, put in new methods. So that sort of things is still going. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we'll find something good. Hopefully. I want to ask you also, Dad, about something because um, with regards to coronavirus, there's a lot of people talking different things around the world, you know, and uh, you, you've, we've already talked about the risks of vaccine, but also um, there's been talks, and I know there are certain countries where they're actually putting chips in people's, yeah. like China and all this stuff. And I've talked to people from different backgrounds. Some people think the whole microchip thing is just silly talk, like that's not possible, that's a conspiracy. But mm -hmm. I know that you, you yourself, and I think one of your colleagues have used microchips, haven't you, in koalas? We, we used it in koalas. Okay, could you tell koalas. us? Koalas. So what they do, they put the microchip, but that's for environmental study, not for, for scientific study. Yeah. It, it is science, but it's environmental sciences. But so the point, the, the point is, it's possible. Yeah, they put the chip in the koala, and they track. They have looked like a, a radar, so they can track the koala where the ko the koala move, which tree the koala prefer, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they do the study about uh, the koala habitat on that. So it is working, and they can you know know where the koala going, in which tree, in which place, how far, and. It depends how sensitive the, the apparatus you're using or, or the thing, maybe five kilometer, 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer, it depends. So they can track the animals from very far distance. Yeah. So it is possible. And the point is if the governments wanted to do that to human beings, they could. Well, I mean, there is a lot of talk about that. I mean, there yeah. are a lot of people talking about that and probably they, it's speculation. I mean, yeah. nobody mentioned about it in details. They say they might that interfere with the nervous system. They can probably give some signals to that chip, and the, the chip maybe will uh, do some damage to the to the brain and so on. So, it's all speculation. But they can at least track people. Yeah, we don't know. Oh, yeah, I mean, track people now. They can track you in just when you're mobile in your pocket. Exactly. Yeah. So that's all right. That's easy. They can track us when we talk about something. They can know. Correct. Well, what about what was probably uh, the proudest moment from your work, from your studies? 
Was there a particular thing? Well, a lot of things coming from my study, particularly when, when we send paper for publication and when we become accepted internationally, we feel that look like a triumph. Mm. Yeah. And also when we find something in the tissue culture. I remember when I developed a koala cell line, because what, what my thinking is to study the, the, the koala chlamydia, I have to grow it in koala cells. Okay. Koala itself as, a, as a, an animal, it's highly protected. Nobody can use koala in, in any experiment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But what we can use, if the koala was hit by a car, it's almost dead, the mm. animals. We can probably try to grow some cells from dead animals, nearly dead animals. Mm. Yeah. And then I succeed to, to, to achieve that. And uh, it was very difficult way how to adapt koala cells to, to normal tissue culture conditions. Because the koala is eating eucalyptus, lots of phenol product in the eucalyptus, and they have different system mm. and things. And the cells always in different environment, not like human or like other, other uh, organisms. So to adapt that, so I, I use the special technique and we published that as, as well in a journal, which is very prestige journal. That's a good one as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so start, we start studying the chlamydia infecting koala cells. That was a big one. Are you still well, involved? I have to do it now. Maybe it's been lost because <laughs> when you leave the lab, new person will come with a different interest, a different approach. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with any, any of your old colleagues or are you still involved in some way? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I remember when you, you you asked me to help that lady for a job. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote to one of my colleagues in the university. I don't know what happened to it. Yeah. And uh, he said, "Yeah, I will meet her and see what." I don't know. She got the job or not? I don't know. Uh, that was back in Melbourne, so I moved. Uh, since, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I still have yeah some some okay. contact with them, but not much, because I'm busy with my garden now. <laughs> it's a good garden it's a good garden <laughs> so just going back to family I, I'll, I'll digress a little bit there, there was a day that, you, that came when um, you found yourself fulfilling your father's word uh, and I was I feel super blessed because I was there when you had that conversation with your dad in Iraq mm -hmm. and then I remember the day when I was probably 18 years old so so much older and you got your brothers together and you said, this is what my father wanted. How did that feel for you? Yeah, I feel I'm, I, I did my job. That's, that's what makes you happy mm. all the time. So yeah. when you do whatever you ask, and then when you accomplish that, that's what you need. I'll tell you the most thing that I got from you as a, as a father, as a role model for me, is it, it's something that is in my opinion, lacking in society today. And that's your word. You know, your, your word is, when you give your word about something, you do it. And exactly. a lot of people ask me today, you know, sometimes, uh, I can't believe you did that, you know, uh, and I just say, I told you I was gonna do that. Because, mm -hmm. and pe the reason why people are surprised, I never feel special when they give me that compliment. Mm -hmm. Because I, because I, for me, it's, I just told you I was going to do that today. So I'm not going to sleep until it's done. Simple. Exactly. Because I think people's word these days doesn't mean as much. They'll say, yeah, I'll do this or yeah, I'll do that. And they may never even do it. So the, 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 the strength of someone's word has been diminished, I think, in many ways. And the most thing that I've got from you throughout the course of my life is how strong your word is. When you give your word to your father, to your wife, to anybody, your work colleagues, you, you do it no matter what. Well, I think that's part of bravery. If you're brave enough, you will do whatever you want. Mm. And if you have a goal, you have to achieve that goal. Mm. You have to work for that. You, have, you, you, sh you need to have a determination to determine 
what you're going to do. And you have to feel that you're going to succeed in that. That feeling is very important. That was with me always. Whatever degree I apply for it, I was having the feeling that I'm going to succeed in that. I'm going to get it. Why do you think, why do you, think you were number one so many times? You finished first, first, first. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's probably is that gift from God, maybe. I, I, I don't know. I, even sometimes I wasn't actually preparing for the exam and then I go to the exam and pass easy. Just listening to the lecture or whatever, something like that. And uh, I, think, I think I believe in myself. Hmm. That's what I, I always treasure that. Because if, if you have any hesitation to do something, you will never achieve it. But if you determine, if you have that sort of uh, power to do something, you will do it. Nothing impossible. Hmm. Nothing impossible. Put the goal for yourself, plan for it, you will get it. And is that, do you think that's the main habit that's been the contributor to your success? Yes. It is really important hmm. because that is the, what they call it, the, 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 the foundation for, for any work you do in the future. Believing in yourself, that is the real, real cornerstone, what they call it. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, the foundation. is important, yeah. Yeah. And here you have to, to have no fear. Fearless. Always be strong. I remember when I was a kid, you told me that on the soccer field, if you, <laughs> if when you get on that soccer field, if you do not have the belief in yourself that you can get past the whole team and score, yeah. you, shouldn't even, you shouldn't even be on there. <laughs> well, that's it. But it's great advice. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And for people that don't have that strength, uh, Dad, and that don't have that belief in themselves, what advice would you have for people who, who are a bit weak that way? Well, if they're weak, they should think about how, they, how to develop themselves. Okay. Because in, in, if I'm not familiar with any language, what mm. shall I do? Learn. I will start from the beginning. I will look on the letters, learn the letters, how they form the word, how they form the sentence, how mm. they put the sentence together and so on. So if they are weak, they should think about what's the weak point. Yeah. And then from there, they can start. And they shouldn't give up. This is important. I'm telling you, never ever give up. Like when I apply to go to the to, to Manchester and it didn't work. I didn't give up. Mm. If I give up, I will stay like a high school teacher teaching biology and chemistry and that's it. Never uh, moved to Australia. Hundreds or thousands of my colleagues are still, uh, they were still doing the same work. Yeah. But, but I didn't, I didn't give up. I said, okay, if it's not going to work here, it'll, go, it'll work somewhere else. Mm. And then the time was passing and I'm getting older and older. I have to be quick. I have to be quick. And then I have, see, this is the, the other things. I wasn't really thinking about myself only. I was thinking about my family. Mm. I, I need a good environment for my kids to grow. I need to, to live not in an environment that the one that I lived. I, I want to, to live in an environment. They can test the freedom, the democracy, they yeah, can yeah. think about to do everything. Mm -hmm. So the, the chances are open for them, they can do whatever. They can do engineering, could do medicine, do business, do, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, uh, and I, I thank you. That was my thinking. And then I said that they not, I don't want them to suffer like I did. So I want them to live in real freedom, to be free from everything. And I, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. <laughs> well, that's what, that's what I planned and everything went right. I am so happy. You did. And uh, also I want to talk about something throughout your whole time in studying. I know and research, 
uh, you've done a lot for the community as well. Uh, and in particular for refugees, can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, when, when the refugees start coming after the Gulf War, uh, I was attending the church, the Melkai church in South Brisbane. Mm. And uh, was Father uh, Lawrence Ayub, God bless his soul, mm. uh, the parish priest. Yes. Yeah, and uh, we thought that we'll do something for the refugees. So we formed a, a group and called St. Clemens Melkai Church Refugee Support Group. And uh, we start, you know, receiving families coming mm. to Brisbane. Yes. And uh, we look after them, take them to the center link, take them to the uh, Medicare, to the bank, talk about the system in Australia, looking for accommodation, helping them to get their kids in the schools, and all the, those things. We run that, and we did that for about five, six years, I don't remember. I, I remember. We even got them furniture, everything in their house. Yeah, 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 everything. Yeah. They have look like a fund from the government. Give yes. them some money and we try to use this money to get whatever they need. And it wasn't just for Iraqis. I remember you helping Africans, you know. Yeah, yeah, anyone. Anyone. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Yeah. And you were doing that while you were still <laughs> doing your research, while you were working at night on <laughs> a newspaper. Yeah, and you all that. Can do everything. <laughs> How did you have the energy for that? I don't know. <laughs> faith, faith give us energy. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, actually, that's, that's very important. I just want to mention about it, and even for, for the youth. Yeah. And the youth is not, I don't think it's doing well in he, here in Brisbane, but maybe in Sydney and Melbourne, probably because it's a big community there, but no, they're right. they need, you know, they need to use, you know, that uh, the facilities here is, it's a lot. I mean, it's, it's probably you can use everything. You have everything. You can contact anyone using, you know, the social, uh, <clears throat> yeah. whatever, whatever. And you can probably plan for them to do some social events. You can plan for them to, to attend, you know, liturgies and uh, mm. Christmas or Christi uh, Christian uh, occasions, mm. whatever, you know, they, you can organize lectures or talks to talk about whatever, you know, believe that it'll, it'll serve the community, the youth community. Mm. You can study what's the problem, what sort of problem facing in these days, in this, in this time and elaborate on that, work on that, and make them, you know, to, to be attracted to, to the talks and to whatever. So they can serve the church, they can work for themselves, they can work for the others as well. Mm -hmm. Because we're not just connected to, to, to the church, we are also connected to each other. So we have to work for each other and then we work for the church. So that's, that's sort of faith will bring the person, make the person more active. It probably changed something in his mind because faith will help the, the, the person to develop a lot of things in his mind. They can be brave, they can trust himself, they can, they can uh, uh, become trustworthy, they become, you know, everything, you know, they, they, they will get a lot of positive things. Mm. And they will plan for their life in a better way. Yeah. They have faith. If they don't have faith, they will go anywhere. And they will get lost in the, in the community. They don't know which way is the right. Because the, the values in, the, in our faith will bring the person not just to God, but to the community. Mm. To be a useful person in the community. He'll be good for his family. He'll be good for his parents. He'll be good for everything. And he'll never do the wrong thing. He's also going to do the right thing because he will know what's right, what's wrong. Yeah, exactly. And that's faith. Otherwise, that. you know, the, the community is filled with a lot of troubles, a mm. lot of junk around. 
So that's what we need. We need really hard work for the, for, for the youth. So you need to have, start with the small groups, small groups, and in those uh, groups, small groups, you will find a mentor from one of group, the other, you appoint one or you ask one, that's will connect, contact other people. Social media, it's, it's available for everyone. So 10 people can become 100, 100 become 1,000 and so on. So they start from very small group and then they start to in, yeah, in, that influence each other. Because I know 10 people, you know 10 people, other student will know, other person will know, and then if you come all together, gradually we'll, we'll have a very big group. So that, that's not hard, not hard. With the help also with the clergy as well, with the priest, with the deacons, whatever, whatever in the church. Well, I know a lot of kids these days, are, I hear them a lot saying that they're tired, they're tired. I hear that word a lot. Yeah, because they, they're busy with too, too many things. Yeah. That's why they're tired. Mm. Suppose that you, you're sitting here doing that interview and your mind is thinking about other. That's a problem. If you have business, you have a relationship with somebody, you have a, a problem with the other one, you have uh, something in the market, you have, you have something in it. So that... The, yeah. That sort of situation, you will never can, you will never let you to focus on something, mm. and that that's why they not succeed in their approach. Yeah, that's beautiful, Dad. Well, we've got to wrap up soon, so I only have one or two other questions for you, um, and it's about parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good question. I'll tell you, and and this is no secret to me. You, you're you're my hero. You always have been, and the reason being for that is because. Uh, when I think about, you know, strength, when I think about family values, when I think about determination, focus, attitude, you've been an amazing example for us, you, and you still are, uh, because I know for a fact in this world that we live in today, it's so different from the world that you grew up in, you know, when you had your family and everything like that. Today, there's so much more distraction, there's so much more temptation, there's so much more, all, all everything is there, you know, um, but when I, when I think of an example of how to be a good father, how to be a great husband, how to be, you know, um, a hard worker, having a great work ethic, not complaining, just loving life, that's you as, you as an example to me. So I thank you for that, uh, since from my heart. But also, I want you to also speak to parents of today. So what advice do you have for parents today who are, because... You know, we're seeing more and more divorces. We're seeing more breakups. We're seeing more issues within families, all this sort of stuff. We didn't, I was very blessed. Uh, my wife's also very blessed. You know, um, we grew up with parents that were strong together. Um, and, and I never, you know, I didn't see the things in the relationship that you had with my mum that I see that's so common in relationships. People are getting uh, consumed by gambling, all sorts of rubbish these days. And they're part of the church, which is crazy, you know, and even people obviously who aren't part of the church are getting distracted with so many things. So I want you, I mean, I mean, I'll take the advice, but I want you to speak to fathers in particular. Um, what advice do you have for them? New fathers or fathers that have well, been for a while? Well, one, one, one advice, which is, which is include all to have faith. Okay. Faith is the backbone of our life. Faith in God? everything will be will going to be pulled in apart. So faith in God or faith in yourself or what? what? Faith in God first. Okay. Yeah. To, to love God, to love the church, because these two things is important in our life. Mm. Second, trust. Husband and wife, they have to trust each other. Okay. If, if there is no trust between them, they will fall apart. They will, they will go. Mm -hmm. It'll never exist, because that, because if you if you have, if you have that sort of trust, you will never think about any problems with your wife or with with your wife's relation with others and uh, 
her uh, attitude to her parent, to her friends, to her whatever, whatever, same. So that's, that's important because what I said before, because they asked me to deliver some speech to the, to the engaged people. I said, listen, our life, it's circles. The first circle, it's you and your wife. That's the middle one. The second circle is your parents and your wife's parents. Yep. The third circle is your friends, your wife's friends. The, 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 the fourth one is the communication between all these. Hmm. Is it going in harmony? Everything is nice. Everything is happy. Everything is, is going in, in the right direction. You will have great. The other thing is, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, is goal. If you have a goal to build a family, that family will, will last forever. It will never break. If you mind to have a relationship for something in your brain or in your uh, purpose, that will fall apart. Yeah. You know what I mean? No. So families... From there, you will come to the children. Hmm. If you look on your children and keep thinking about them, they are child, they are tiny bits, whatever, that's not going to work. Okay. They have to make your child feel that he is a unique person. He is able to do whatever he wants to do. Treat him as a friend. Uh, if he boy like a man, if he's girl like a, a, a young lady, so to have that sort of power in herself, mm. her mind, so that connection make the father happy with the kids, the kids happy with the father. Yeah. The father, ha the mother happy with the kids, the kids happy with the mother. So that sort of relationship, family relationship is important. If you have those points together, the family will be strong as rock. Never, ever fall apart. Never. But the relationship between the family members weak, or if there is a doubt or is there a weakness. I don't know. I mean, I, probably um, I have different philosophy, not like other fathers, whatever. No. I, I, I never feel that that my son less than me never have that sort of feeling because if we feel that we are less than others mm. how are we going to survive yeah tell me how are we going to survive no we're not going to survive mm. we shouldn't have that sort of feeling i i never felt that you ask me why you were first i never felt that i am less than others Okay. I was always feeling that I'm like equal to the others, maybe a bit better, better than them. Yeah. So, and then the other thing is, they shouldn't be mean. I mean, that sort of things, uh, that's killing the, the community. Everybody need to have something for himself. And make himself that he is number one. Mm. And the rest of the family is nothing. So it's ego. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. That's one of the obstacles in our life. Yeah. So there's too many things. I mean, if you, if you read the books of psychology about human psychology and family or child psychology and all of these things, hmm. you will discover something it's, it's really important. Like, like I, I believe that the kids see their parents like seeing themselves in the mirror. Hmm. So they can see themselves through their parents. Yes. If there is a weak parents, the kids will be uh, definitely be weak. I still remember one of the fathers of the year in America, yeah. they asked him a question. They said, tell me how, how you become father of the year. You know what he said? He said, because my parents brought me to be a good father. Yeah, very simple. Very simple. Yeah. So that sort of things. So, 
parents have to think about their kids, think about themselves, and they are the mirror of the kids. They can see themselves through them. Mm. If they fall apart, the kids will fall apart as well. Yeah. So they will be affected physically and psychologically. Mm. They can achieve that because if you need a strong body, you have to have a strong back. Right? Yes. Your back is weak. You will never can develop a good body at all. Yeah, correct. Which is, I, that's, that's in psychology. So you need something to, to back you, to be strong. So mm -hmm. that back up from where? From the parents. That sort of things. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, this is actually probably very important, but I don't know how much people link to that or, or stuck to that. Never say no for your kids. But has to be the right question. Mm. If they ask you the right question, say yes. If they ask you something, say yes. Because saying no without studying or without knowing what they need, that's very bad, yeah. very, very bad. So that sort of relationship is important, very important. So. So you have to see your kids, so just to summarize, you have to see your kids as someone that is unique. Uh, give them of course. The, of course. Give them every the, person on this earth is unique. And has a gift. Because there is no other copy of him. Yeah, and they have a gift. So you have yeah. to and them. because you are unique, you are, you are my second son. My first son, not like you. It's different. My yeah. first son is not like, like the first son. Every person is unique. I'm the best. And, <laughs> <laughs> they all equal. In my <laughs> eye, they all equal. Oh no, it's all right. Yeah. See, that's I got that competitiveness from you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, I mean, that's for yourself. If you are the best, that's that's good on you because you 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 make yourself the best. Mm. Nobody can can give you something unless if you look for it and get it for yourself. Well, people ask me why in different careers that I've had, how come I became a manager or a director in other companies that I work for? And I just said to them, very simple, I have to continue to grow. Yeah. What, what am I doing in one position if I'm not growing? What's the point of life if you are not growing and, and moving forward? It's natural that you grow into a leadership role or something like that or, or just become a master of your art. It's, that's, that's what we're designed to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's well, great I mean, advice, Bob. See that 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 thing is never stop. I mean, you are in certain position now. You shouldn't stop at this position. No way. You should think to to be better and better. That's right. So yeah, that's important, really. One question I have for you that I ask for all uh, my guests, and it's a funny question. I think you you know the one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you can go back in time and meet your 18 year old self yeah. any advice you would give him yeah peter asked me the same question when i was visiting them did he <laughs> i said cheating. one word fear less fear less, fear less. yeah you, you, you didn't have any fears if you, if you have no fear you can do everything you will be brave you will be oriented you will be focused you you will have goals in your life you will have everything so if i I go back to Adib when he was 18. Probably I got all of these things naturally. Yes. That's what I'm here. Yeah. Because I've got all of these. I, I never ever have a fear from anything. Why is Your that? life with me, did you feel that I'm fear from something? No. Or I'm scared from something? Never. Not from another person? Not from... Nothing. Any... Yeah. Nothing. I never practice that. I never say I, I scare from that or I don't like that or I never. Yeah. That, that sort of foundation we needed to build our personality. Why is it that you have no fear though? Is it because you have a strong faith in God, belief in yourself, both those things? Yes, and trust as well. Trust in what, you? Trust in, in, in myself, in my family, 
Mm. Everything. Okay. Yeah. Without that, you will get uh, lost. I'm sure. That's okay. Awesome. Well, that has been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to have you on. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. You, you, you make me to remember all my life <laughs> from day one till now. Actually, I did have one last question. One last question. Uh, now that you're retired and enjoying life, what, what do you feel is your purpose now? Well, my purpose is I enjoy my life with my wife and with my kids, with my grandkids. Yep. And doing whatever, reading whatever, I couldn't do it when I was on, on workforce, you know. So I have a good time. And you're still involved with the church in Brisbane? You, you, I think yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, of course. You've got a few leadership we're, roles. We're looking to have a, one day a Chaldean church here in Brisbane. Hopefully we'll one day. We'll work, we'll work on that. Yeah. I'll do my part. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Well, Bob, well, thank you so much for your time with us. Any last words before you let you go? Yeah, I, I think the last word is good on you. You're doing a great job. Wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dad. God bless you. Bye.